The proudest and the most fanatical football nations on Earth are simultaneously located in the poorest continent of the planet. And here in Africa, not only reigns remorseless poverty, hungry families, and lack of resources, but there is also lots of love for the game and the big dream to succeed on the big stage in the sport of football. We never had much, only big dreams and fire. In the struggle when the time's been rough, passion leading the way like a lighter. Blessed with the heart of a liar. The question we feel but we try on We believe no illusion Push it through with the low and emotion yeah. In the street we've been playing with the tin can Satisfied with some rice and chicken Now we running big things anyway Going to a brighter day yeah. I believe one life, one dream No matter what, keep it up for the team No doubt in my mind When I fall I get up yeah. every time Late time's gone Deine Zeit, dein Moment ist genau so Late time's gone Vertrau auf dein Herz und dann nicht auf die anderen, no. Lebe dein Traum. Oh, just believe in yourself right now. Lebe dein Traum. Hold on. Can you get the keys no doubt? Oh, oh, oh. Tumbula, oh. Tumbula, oh. Hast du Spaß, ist du alles, was du brauchst? Lebe dein Traum. Oh, oh, oh. Tumbula, oh. Lebe dein Traum. Oh, oh, oh. Wir laufen und lernen niemals auf. Du bist reich, aber hast nichts. Nur das Feuer und das Sack, der du schaffst es. Alles, was du baust, ist die Praxis. Also lauf los, Mann, wart nicht. Gib Gas, wenn du machst, was du machst. Viel Spaß, wenn du schaffst, wenn du lachst. Lass die Zweifel vergehen. Alles wird man, du wirst schon sehen. Wir laufen und hören niemals auf. 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 Lebt dein Traum. Deine Zeit, dein Moment ist genau so. Lebt dein Traum. Vertrau auf dein Herz und dann nicht auf die anderen, no. Lebe dein Traum, boy. Just believe in yourself right now. Lebe dein Traum, hold on. Can you get the keys, no doubt? Lebe dein Traum, oh, oh, oh. Lebe dein Traum, oh. Hast du Spaß, hast du alles, was du brauchst? Football, I would say, is the number one sport here in Ghana. <laughs> Every day there are more media providers. Never before the audience has consumed more football through the media than today. Also because of the splitting of matches throughout the week, the DFL, aka German Football League, was able to almost triple the revenue through TV money deals in the last 10 years to more than 1 billion euros. But many clubs are now demanding more money because of their ability to compete with the English Premier League. Its club gets 6.9 billion euros through the recent TV contracts. Football is now in the same league as Hollywood stars. Just this summer, Dembele, who is 20 years old, was paid more than 100 million euros to transfer from Dortmund to Barcelona. A star like Lewandowski receives a salary of 2 million euros in Munich. Despite what the commercials make it look like, soccer there has long ceased to be a game for the little people. It is a multi-billion euro business for about 12 years with on-growing sales. In France, Neymar was transferred to Paris Saint-Germain. Paris pays a transfer fee of more than 200 million euros for Neymar from Barcelona, a record. The new transfer record of 200 million euros transfer fee for Neymar is a violation of the so-called financial fair play clause. In accordance with it, clubs can only pay what they actually earn. We see a trend in sports that it's also present in our society, which is not so positive to see. This means that big players are getting richer and this affects not only the clubs but the associations and the smaller players too. They are less likely to be able to keep up with a fast pace and when the balance is no longer there, it becomes more difficult to keep up. This is not the case today. But in the past, players here in Germany experienced it firsthand. Oh, hey. 
I played in, in Germany myself, and I didn't understand any of it. I couldn't read it as well. I signed a contract, and it was all in German. How was I supposed to know, to understand it? I signed the contract for five years, thinking it was only going to be for two years. In the case of Charles Connor, called CK, this is no mere slander. As this case was already discussed on German television in 2010, on the TV show Sport 3. I had a two-year contract with a two-year option, and after that, one-year option. This, this means that I have to play for five years. In the beginning, you really want to come here and play. But when you learn how business works, you realize this is no good. I've been cheated or something. This is not a unique case. Among the self-proclaimed advisors and scouts, there are thousands of them who are willing to do anything to participate in the million-dollar business of professional soccer. The prosperous player salaries, astronomical transfer fees, and provisions for agents from all over the world are attracting new entrepreneurs to the professional soccer industry every day. You dream of becoming a professional soccer player. You want to go everywhere. At that moment, we would often watch the Bundesliga soccer in Ghana. The big dream of becoming rich and famous on your own two feet and escape the bitter poverty is stronger today than it has ever been. This is dreamt by the smallest of them all, like our little friend, Yarti Gigi. Gigi has been in love with soccer since he was six years old. But he is one in a million in Africa, what we call a talent. That would be transferred to one of the state-of-the-art soccer schools in Germany without hesitation. If possible, the parents would scream about the talent he is, and their little town would be very proud of Gigi, telling stories of their talent and promising future. But here in Africa, Gigi is all alone. With his mother and brothers, Gigi is alone with his dream of making it big on the world stage of football. Education is very important in the life of Gigi. I've always encouraged him to study very hard, as much as soccer. In case things do not turn out to be possible, or if he does not reach his goal of playing professionally, he has to have an education. The coach is always trying very hard to look after Gigi. Even though he has no financial assistance, I sometimes have to look out for both my son and the coach financially. It's very difficult to take care of both of them, but it is a burden I have to carry if I want my son to have a better life, a sacrifice for his future, and ours as well. The coach will help in many ways, but yes, I have to help out as much as I can. And finally, the hard question, what would she do if a gentleman from Europe came to town and offered her 100,000 euros for little Gigi? Would she be willing to accept the money? Only if the agent agrees for him to call his mom regularly, saying, hello, mom, how are you? If he agrees, then I'd have no problem saying yes. No problem. Uh, if the agent offered me 100,000 euros, I would, I would have to split it in three ways, because the coach has endured financial hardship helping Gigi with soccer and other things. I would divide the money in three parts. One for Gigi, one for the coach, and one for myself. Yes, I believe that is the correct way to divide the money. But before the big money, big stadiums and clubs become interested in little Gigi, there are several other opportunities he needs to experience, such as the opportunity to eat, to sleep, and to play. Without small schools in town, kids would not be able to have shoes or even a ball. But the club system in almost all African countries, as well as the youth player development system, is not at all comparable to the systems in Europe. 
The soccer schools in Africa look like youth or recreational centers. There is no government support for coaches, managers, and directors, and there is no support from FIFA or European clubs. The children here in Africa play as they did 30 years ago, with a broken, sometimes flat soccer ball on the sandy ground. This and other reasons are why former professional soccer players look after the children and mentor them on and off the field, often without getting paid for it. Jonathan Blade is one of them. It's sad to see parents struggle when having to feed their family. And then I see the passion for soccer in the little ones. It's so hard sometimes, and so I have to call on for help to give me support. The parents of such children have no money and live simple farming lives, struggling day to day to survive. The occupation of this town is farming. There are no other jobs here. The ones who call themselves coaches and advisors are always hoping to get one of their young players to go to Europe by contacting scouts who are regularly traveling through the country or handing them over to the big regional soccer schools. But they don't pay as much in commission. The commissions are very low, very low. I once worked with the West Football Academy and they paid me 1,000 Ghana sedis. They were all putting their hopes on me. I just tell them, you don't have any money. If you want to become great, you have to work very hard. You have to always, always look for your chance. Even with these conditions, players from these environments make it to the top European leagues every year. Mohamed Gigi of FC Dreams, with his small soccer school and soccer club included, has much to be proud of. Um, ever since we formed this club as Dreams FC, we've been able to produce a place in the name of uh, Baba Rahman, who plays in Chelsea. Um, we have uh, Ni um, Emmanuel Ajaysoa, who is playing for Anderlecht. We have uh, Benjamin Tete, who is playing in Liège, Belgium. We have uh, Basit Khalid, who is playing in uh, Prisnia, in Kosovo. We have uh, Johnson Ousu Opon, who is playing in Braga. Here in Africa, we talk about producing players for the world market. There are different business models on how to train players and how to get them there, and therefore how to produce them. But in addition to these unrealistic methods for us, there are also the international soccer schools that are supported, such as the Red Bull-sponsored Wafa Performance Center. First of all, I have to go back to your first question about uh, um, Wafa or about uh, Right to Dream. And they could not produce best players to European clubs. That is, the business is a different model. Our, our business is different to their business. And we have also contacts in Europe. We make sure we go around all the country to look for the best of the talent. We put them in our youth team. And if we think they are good, then we invite the scouts to Ghana to come and watch and pick. Wafa, a former Red Bull performance center, which has been built for several million in the middle of an African wasteland, uses the European concept of working with young footballers, high quality pitches, state of the art equipment, and a life like that of a holiday paradise. By trying to create an atmosphere unparalleled to any other in the African continent, pushing the boundaries to make better players, but the achievements remain subtle. Not a single player went from these fields in Africa to one of the top four leagues in Europe. Carl Broken is a manager of Wafa. He has been in Africa all his life. 
With his development site, he works without agents or consultants. Wafa always deals directly with the clubs and strictly adheres to the underage guidelines. These guidelines allow no underage players to be sold. Therefore, in recent years, it is nearly impossible for these rules to be lenient. Wafa has made sure all of these rules apply to every underage player and makes sure everyone knows about them. Well, I'm, I'm even longer in Africa. I'm in Africa since 1985. And uh, I was scouting for clubs and uh, was a bit agent since 85. I was in Congo, Senegal, Sierra Leone. There is no money in the system for sponsoring. And then all the big f football companies like Adidas and Puma, and uh, I think they are less interested because they want to sell their shirts, but the people cannot pay the shirts. Not only are most African associations ignored by sponsors, even FIFA and many other associations do not give any assistance due to the way that talent scouts explore for and find their talent. They can't, most of the Ghanaian teams can't compete with uh, other African, uh, I'm talking about French speaking African uh, clubs. If you want to play international uh, African Champions League or uh, African, Af African League, uh, you have to do it on your own expenses. For him is clear where the support should be coming from. From FIFA or from maybe uh, other clubs big clubs in Europe. A lot of teams are not, uh, sometimes are not participating because they cannot uh, bear the cost. The Champions League, which has great prestige in Europe and pays a lot of money to the clubs, has to be paid in almost all African countries by the clubs themselves. This means that the players travel, hotels and tickets have to be paid by the clubs. They have to pay to participate in the Champions League and to prove themselves in Africa. What will be uh, a big help is uh, the poverty. If the poverty could change, that will be a very good thing for Africa in general and for the development of the players. Because at the end, it is all poverty. It does not matter whether it's the self-managed soccer schools in rural neighborhoods or the Red Bull Soccer School, funded with millions of euros from Europe. They all have to struggle with the same problems, with a low income, extreme poverty, lack of resources, and the high cost of doing business with the hustle and trading of all their talents. Many blame the hundreds of scouts, agents, or mediators for the suffering of the children, the players. But is it really justified? That's what we asked African and soccer expert Paul Neff. Searching for football talent in Africa is very interesting because of several factors, you know. On one hand, because you come across players with a lot of talent, whom you would be negotiating about with big consultant agencies here. On the other hand, because it's more fun to scout there, it's more fun to watch a tournament at a field in terrible conditions than watching the little things that happen at the junior Bundesliga. The big news that the media is already reporting have been already covered by the business behind the scenes of the soccer world. You start to understand that down there in Africa, you really have to focus on the talent of the player and cut out all the other distractions that the player is exposed to, you know? That's very important. Africa offers so much potential, which is used only by French and Belgian clubs. But I think that Germany is behind when it comes to the area. I think that it is time to move forward. In the next 10 years, Africa is going to change, just like South America changed 30 years ago. 
Italy as well, and the reason is because they have a few loopholes where they can move players to their country at a younger age. These are normally the first countries to do so. To carry such a big responsibility on your shoulders, scouting young adults and adolescents, a special training is surely needed. Langsam. The people are barely understanding. It's not normal that people who have nothing to do with the soccer game have all the power. Obviously, there are people who only want to make money, but sometimes the output's still good, because without the ones who really make money, not many soccer players would get here. Honestly, I think that um, it is the players that make a coach's career and not the opposite. Managers, um, managers tend to make the players believe that they have the power to make them play in the greatest clubs and have amazing careers, but I don't believe that it's the way things work. What characteristics are needed to become an agent to the new up-and-coming soccer talents? I think that more than just having expert knowledge so he can give players useful tips and help them advance athletically, he also needs to be reliable, be there and really believe in the player. Um, he should not only care about making money but also care for the player's well-being. Well, um, I believe the player's health always comes first and foremost. I took my junior brother Ishmael, I gave him to a big agent, I don't want to man mention his name, and because he have all these big names players, he didn't have time for this young boy. So what's the point? He, he put the boy in the club and uh, going about making millions from the big players. Listening to the fact that scout agencies don't provide the best results for the younger players, what about the soccer schools? Are the big academies the right solution for our GG? There is obviously no advantage in the subject of soccer for the players who are not in the big academies, because even if they were very talented, they would always be better if they train under professional conditions. The advantage for me as a scout or a talent agent is that the players are normally easier to pick out. There are less interested people involved. Except that it is easier to take advantage of the kids in Africa. It is easier to take advantage of them because people will go recruit them and bring them back because they are going through harder situations. Most of the time we are handling it directly with clubs and if something doesn't work, the boy comes back or uh, we, we are not going through agents. The interesting thing is that the guys are probably not the most talented, but they were lucky enough to get in there and blend it with everyone else and happen to be discovered, as opposed to the guys on the street who just weren't lucky, you know? I believe that just looking at the players' natural skills, Africa is an endless source of high-quality players, but uh, education is just different and their playing soccer is tied by European soccer playing, their opportunities are so different. It's important for the teenager African player to leave Africa as soon as possible to train under professional conditions. And we also have to understand that the African 17-year-old is not necessarily a child anymore that has to be protected. Boys usually leave school at 12 or 13 to make money and support their families. The clubs in Germany have to examine the consultants as well because it's not right for a consultant to take away from his home a 17-year-old player. It's not right. Without their parents, how is that supposed to work? It's not normal. If you have no idea how the business works, you won't know how much money to ask for. That's the reason why mediation agents are needed. But of course there are bad mediation agents that make too much money, that don't look well enough after that boy, especially in bad times. So there are bad mediation agents here and there. I think uh, it would be good if there was an age uh, limit. It's very important. Um, I'm not sure about that, you know. But 18 years old sounds good, I think, because it matches the legal age uh, in France to be considered as an adult, you know. 
I think that the transfer age of 18 is not a good one in Africa because the reality is actually very different. It is a disadvantage for single players that may have the potential to switch to another club because they're not allowed to do it. The protection of the underage is not adequate. A 16-year-old young African football player is not a child in Africa anymore. That is definitely not the way we see it in Europe. Protection against people is always relative because protection may be a hindrance of a chance in this case. And the player that transfers early can help feed his whole family for years. It is always a question of how we see things. From another point of view, maybe they deserve that chance. So we have to be very careful when talking about protection, you know? Again, these are actual kids we're talking about here. Uh, a universal age limit for the whole world is completely disconnected from reality. I believe German street soccer is dead, to be honest. That is my personal opinion. All the places where I played soccer a long time ago are now abandoned. And the guys in Africa are real street soccer players, just like the ones that we once had in Europe. The first guy who went to my trial season was a young kid from Mali that was in Frankfurt in January, so it was extremely cold. I saw how he did his first walk through the woods in Germany. It was very fascinating because the player naturally wanted to do well, and we had a lot of difficulty trying to figure out if he was just in fact too cold or if he was lacking something, because he didn't want to show off. He looked good all the time. Actually, it's more of a job to the young, talented players in Africa than compared to those in Europe because they carry another responsibility. They feel not only hope, but they also feel responsible for the investment of their family and extended families. At the age of 14 and 15, they notice that very much and that for them makes them want to become a professional. That's the reason why the younger players often play with lesser enthusiasm. At least it seems that way, because they have another kind of pressure. And that really is a heartbreaking pressure. We also notice that European clubs, more precisely the German clubs, struggle with Africa because they try to apply their norm, which honestly makes no sense to them. It's very different. But can't the soccer schools and training centers influence how much time kids have to spend in Africa? There are a few academies that uh, give you kind of a list with rules, like the jumping height and running speed of the boy. One time I gave that list to Rapid Vienna and uh, the trainer looked at it and began to ask under what circumstances the boy jumped and when he ran. For me as a layman, it seemed like they were doing really professional work, but for the person at Rapid Vienna, just laughed at it. If a family has a talented boy, it could be the ticket out of poverty for the entire family or even the whole village and the pressure lies heavily on the boys' shoulders. But as always, there are real people behind the transfer lists and statistics. Some stories are so horrifying you almost cannot believe them. Others are success stories that make the traditional rags-to-riches stories pale in comparison. We have decided to tell you the story of the German-African footballer, which contains both stories. The story of Ibrahim Tanko who arrived at the age of 16 from Africa and became the youngest soccer player in history at the time. He was 17 and still holds the record for the youngest German champion at 17 years and 327 days. When Ottomar Hitzfeld was coach, you know, that was the time I played for Germany and the moment we became champions. Then that's when I created the so-called baby storm with my friend and partner at that time, Lars Ricken. Those were the times when we played our best soccer yet, and after 30 years of having a dry spell, we became champions. Lars Ricken and Ibrahim Tanko's so-called baby storm made a big splash throughout the league in those early years. He was even in the betting pool the following season when BVB won the Champions League title. But his performance went down season after season. There could be many reasons for his decline, but according to Ibrahim himself, it was the pressure to perform at his best that took its toll psychologically and physically on the youngest professional African soccer player in history.
At that moment, I didn't really feel the pressure, to be honest. At that moment, we just played soccer. In the 90s, life for an up-and-coming soccer player was very different than today. In those days, there was no internet, Skype, or Facebook. You could not contact your family being so far away. Even now, there are children that play abroad, thousands of kilometers away from their families, still having to deliver their best performances under different climates, different cultures, and without their friends and family. A very different upbringing. You don't just go from Africa directly to Europe and feel good about it. The culture is different. I remember when I went there at 16 years old, I had to live with a foreign family. I didn't feel good with all those strange rules and procedures. The structure is different. Later on, I started to get used to the different culture, and it was much better, and I truly learned a lot from that new family, and I really liked it, to be honest. I actually think that during that time, there was a period where enemies really questioned several times if they should take their risk to give a young African player the chance to play. But I honestly think that nowadays, it's also a question of how clubs treat this subject. It's all about giving the African player someone on their side um, in the new culture of doing things and um, to help them go through administration, institutions, and to advance in terms of integration. I think it's a way to support them and make it easier for them. At the time when I was playing, it was very difficult to talk to our family because there were no cell phones like today and no social media to get in contact with your family. If you wanted to use the phone, we had to make an appointment. Then we would go to the office, then sit there and, you know, talk to friends and family. It was not as easy as today when everyone can talk on the phone with anyone they want, you know, exactly. Our parents didn't have a telephone back then either. If they wanted to talk to me, they had to go somewhere where somebody had a telephone and then we would make an appointment. In Germany, we also had to make an appointment to be able to go to the office and talk to our parents, you know? It's not as easy as today where you can talk to your parents every day. The unfortunate ending of this story at BVV was the player's expulsion due to a scandal involving marijuana dopage testing. It happened almost like with children without responsible parents, or parents at all, who end up on the wrong path. Only here, we are dealing with a 19-year-old professional soccer player who should have known what he's doing, but nevertheless ended up going on the wrong path. It's also important to understand that for a kid to be successful in football, the presence and relationship with the family is a priority. Meaning that the more a child will play soccer close to his family, the higher the chances are he will become a professional. Of course, if you're there as a soccer player, guys approach you because they know you've turned pro. But you got to know that in reality, they don't want to help you at all. They just want your money and to party all day with you. And I truly thank God that uh, that wasn't the kind of person I wanted to be, you know. But when I made that mistake, I didn't deny it. I didn't fight it. I didn't argue with anyone. I just straight out said, yes, I did. I didn't know it was wrong, that it was some kind of uh, doping. You know, I didn't, uh, as you said, I didn't really understand it. Uh, you know, why should I use drugs to play soccer? I didn't know smoking marijuana, it would hinder on the performance back then. I knew absolutely nothing about it. It was a mistake. I said it back then, and today it's not important, and in the end, none of this matters to me anymore. It's in the past. His lifelong best friend and U-17 coach of the Ghana national team stands behind Ibrahim. I know him from when he was a young boy. He never went into those things, I'm sure, like you said. No parental control, no family. So maybe he fell into some bad company, and then that thing happened. But I'm sure it's the thing of the past. Nowadays, Ibrahim Tanko is an assistant coach of the Ghana national team and prepares young players for life in sports and abroad. 
so that they don't have to repeat his mistakes. But the most beautiful thing is that he has found peace with his past. Today, he is proud of his career and of his two homes, Ghana and Germany. Of course, Germany is my second home. My family and I have become German citizens. We even travel with a German passport. I like being in Ghana and Germany very much, and I often travel there. As everywhere else in the world, a footballer's career in Africa begins in the little soccer leagues. And from the under-17 level onwards, things get very serious in Ghana. Since 1985, real FIFA World Championships have been held here. The only difference is that the winners are based here in the southern half of our country. Germany has four World Championship titles in the adult leagues. Africa has never been able to reach a World Championship Finals. but. If we look at the U-17s, it is exactly the other way around. At the same time, the Africans, with Nigeria and Ghana, won the World Youth Championship title seven times, and Germany did not win it once. An impressive result. Why is there such a big difference, and what makes the young Africans so strong? Coach Fabian, who coaches the Ghana U-17s, will help us find the answers to these questions. The African and the South American players, for example, I think it's something that is inborn. You know, in Europe, they teach, they teach boys how to play football. They can pick somebody and teach him to play football. But here, it's, it's, it's something natural. It comes naturally. You know, at this level, uh, you get a whole lot of agents coming to say sweet things to these boys. Oh, I'll take you there. Oh, I'll take you here. I'll take you where. And some of them, because they are from poor families, the little money they see, they, they want to go quickly. They don't finish developing. You know, you have to get, to you get your development to a certain level before you can go to Europe. It's not easy to go as a 16-year-old, 17-year-old boy to go to Europe and be playing at the top level. Uh, but, like I said, there should be laws to govern this kind of scouting. You just can't come and scout a 15-year-old or a 14-year-old and say, I'm taking you to Europe. You can scout him, maybe put him in a team here, then you'll be watching, you'll be monitoring. When he's of age, he's about 18, then you can come and take him and take along to Europe. Coach Fabian's opinion is very clear. The young players, the children who are still training, should only be transferred out of their home after they reach the legal age of 18. But not everyone shares his opinion, because it doesn't matter whether it is the families who want a career abroad for their children, or the clubs, or the managers, even the players themselves. For many in Coach Fabian's team, it is never too early to go to Europe's top clubs. I try as much as possible to get my, 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 my talents out of Ghana as soon as possible. Everybody, I can tell you for these two boys, I've had over 75 agents contacting me want, wanting to sign with the boys. Yarti is the coach of a couple of top talents in the U-17 national team. His players have not only scored important goals in tournaments, but have also won trophies such as Man of the Match and Man of the Tournament at the Africa Cup. These children, most often also second or third generation players, are the future of African soccer. From, from my father's side, I have two brothers right now. They are all soccer players. One is playing in Dubai, and one is playing in America. So I'm the third one. I'm coming up. To play in the highest level, uh, like playing um, a team like Real Madrid, Barcelona, Manchester United as well. 
Okay, do you know something? I eat football, I drink football, I do football. <laughs> so, so nothing else, yeah. So. Africa have a lot of raw talent, very good talent. And that is why we are actually winning a lot of uh, um, youth championships. But when it comes to the World Cup, the senior national team, we are not winning because we lack much facilities as compared to that of uh, the, the developed countries uh, like Germany, France, e England, US. It took the third place, Ghana was uh, fourth. Now, the guy that won the first top award, as in the best player of that tournament, Christopher Macaulay from Nigeria. And then the second uh, best player was uh, Rans Fodose of Ghana. And then the third was Tony Cruz of Germany. But now, Tony is playing Real Madrid. He won the Champions League. He won the World Cup before. But Rans Fodose is still in Ghana, he is struggling to even get a team to play. I'm sorry to say this, but that's the fact. It is because Tony Cruz, after U17, were graduated into the, the U20 of the German national team, and he had better facility as, at uh, Bayern Munich. Wouldn't it then be better for them if they could go to Hoffenheim, Freiburg, Dortmund, or Munich as soon as possible? And why is the coach so strictly against it? That's why I'm saying that if we can have a policy where we can keep them here till about 18, 19, when they are old enough to sign a professional contract, it will be better for all of us. Let's go outside to go and play because they are paid well in their country. So if we can get these companies in Ghana to also adopt these clubs and pay them well, we can keep most of the boys here, develop them well before they go to Europe. You no, know, some of these agents, I know some boys, some very good players who were taken to Europe by some agents. And when they got to the airport, the guy went and they didn't see the guy again. They had to sleep in the airport and they were brought back. Somebody like this, all his dreams have been shattered. He cannot play football again because he thought he's going to Europe. Somebody takes his money, leaves him at the airport and then runs away. I mean, so. Like I'm saying, if we are able to find a way to keep them here for some time, when they are old enough to take decisions, I think it will be better. Unfortunately, these are not unique cases. There are teenagers who are adopted by strangers from Europe, swindled out of their parents' money, and worse, sent to Europe illegally to be sold to local clubs. Unfortunately, these schemes overshadow the success stories, which of course exist. Because lifting a teenager out of poverty and giving him the opportunity to make a career at a top club with a million euro salary included is the big dream of any coach and of any player living within the poverty of the African nations. This dream came true many times, as in the case of Christian Atsu, Today, he earns his money at Newcastle United. He comes exactly from this poverty, and it originated in a transfer long before he was 18 years old. I'm the manager of Christian Achu. He played my club, Cheetah FC. And uh, Achu, when we got Achu, uh, before he turned 18, we, we shipped him out to Portugal, FC Porto, to be precise. And then he started developing from there. Like, it's all boiled down to coming out with some good policies, some good the laws that will protect these boys from this, uh, so the agents. Some of the agents are, are very bad. They are only interested in the money they will get. I'm not sure it's only African players who are exploited. Asian players are exploited, South American players are exploited. It should be a universal law to take care of these things. We know how to play the game, but we don't have, we don't have the facilities like you have. If we, the day we, have the, we get the facilities that you have in Europe, we'll beat you in the World Cup. But somehow, Africa won a world title. World Cup winner France has a majority of African players. Players of the first, 
second and third generations. We need to be very careful with um, this idea that people are thinking differently in Africa and in Europe. Generally speaking, the parents of some of these, of these, these soccer players were born in Africa. And for that reason, it's perfectly understandable to think, well, that these players represent both nations together. There um, are players from, um, I think, from Guinea. And I feel it's normal that other people from Guinea are very happy that France has won the World Cup because they are being represented, but I don't think they feel like Guinea actually won the World Cup. Um, as a player for the French national team, whenever I would go back to Guadeloupe, um, everyone was happy. And that's normal. Most players of um, the French national team come from a very very poor background, a very poor background, meaning that they are usually children coming from a um, wave of seasonal migration. And today it's true that people notice the fact that there are many children with African background because there are many black players. And that's because over the last few years, most migrants come from sub-Saharan African countries. It's as simple as that. And I do believe that the French soccer teams tell the story of immigration in France. France is a country that uh, colonized, I don't know how many African countries, meaning that um, people, um, people from French-speaking African countries, when they migrated, obviously came to France, creating a mixed population. The World Cup winners from France are all the French people no matter what skin color or origin that shows us again that we not only live in a global world, but also that there are a lot of possibilities for integration. Is there a responsibility towards his home country and his father's father? How do players from the first, second, even third generation in Europe see this? Given the color of my skin, my ancestors obviously come from Africa. And they arrived to Guadeloupe as slaves, so there has been a rupture in history. And I am aware of this, and I think it's important to acknowledge your past, your history. And this is why, as far as I'm concerned, I also feel part of the African people. I think that soccer can legitimate the fact that we should all respect one another's religious beliefs and skin color. James Kwesi Apia, trainer of the Ghana national team, believes he has recognized the signs of the times. When we had the opportunity to speak with him, he showed us that African soccer can only be improved by the players themselves and their willingness to perform. New coach has brought something totally different. Now he says if you're a local player and you play very well, you're playing the Black Stars, and so that, if that's the ultimate, you still get an opportunity here. I think that, you know, in the, first of all, Ghanaians thought that, look, we've tried, you know, foreign coaches for so many years, and it's like always they come and they don't see much difference. So it was time that, okay, Ghana said, okay, let's give our own the chance and see what you can do. So fortunately, I was able to qualify to the, the team to the Cup of Nations, and then I think we got to the semi-finals, the Cup of Nations, and... So we have two youth teams, and all the youth teams are staying in a house. We house them, because that is the best way. You keep them in the house, you feed them, you clothe them, you, you teach them football? Actually, you know, at the national team level, you know, um, now, I've, since I came, I think about two, three months ago, I've created a data where I can put all Ghanaians playing in Europe, America, or wherever, you know, I'm trying to put them on my data so that I can monitor all of them weekly. So I believe in transition. You know, we should have players now, and then the medium term, who are the players that you're looking at? And then on long term, who are the players you're looking at? So this is something that I've planned, and 
I want a situation where even if I'm not around, whoever comes to have this succession plan, you know, for the future of the country. And of course, being a good coach, he has an answer to the question, why do African players have such great talent? And one thing, it's not only me, but Ghanaians believe that when it comes to talents, you know, Ghanaians are born with it in terms of football. You know, they, someone who's a Ghanaian normally, if he hasn't gone to any training, you just take a ball and you see some skill in him. As for transferring of young kids, Coach Appiah shares the same opinion as his U-17 coach, Fabian. He wants to strengthen the National League and offer better conditions to all players here in Africa, instead of selling talent in their early years. For many players, the national team is a kind of precursor game to the big international soccer clubs. That's where young talents can present themselves and show what they can do with the intention of increasing their market value and recommending themselves to Europe. Yeah, so One uh, thing is for sure, every young player who plays soccer here has always been dreaming of going to Europe and playing soccer there. Go earlier than 18 to these clubs to develop as long as there is not, because it handicaps them. The top talents now can only go at 18 years old. That is a handicap for them. Of course, there is this problem of trade of children. That is number two. But it punishes the big talent. It is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, children must be protected. And on the other hand, their talents must be maximized. Are stricter rules and prohibitions helpful? Are they a benefit for the children, or rather a disadvantage in the global competition? You can't prohibit something here. Otherwise, the parents come and say, hey, we don't have anything here. There is no infrastructure, nothing. What are the kids going to do? We are very poor. You can't ban my kid from going somewhere. Take the U-17 who played recently. Now they're getting a lot of offers from Europe, for sure, you know, and as a club or a, an association, you can't, you know, object to that. If you do, then you'll have a very big problem with angry parents. Um, once uh, you consider the um, professional aspect of the organizations, I do believe indeed that France benefits from an organizational structure that will allow a young child to reach its highest potential through its strong professional environment. What would happen if the transferring of young players is forbidden, if violators were punished even harder, and if the clubs were strictly forbidden to transfer young players under contract? We've asked sport journalist Senyu Zorm that question. She has accompanied players around the world. You know what these agents do? They pass behind the clubs and go see the parents. And like I said to you, 99% of these footballers do not come from, you know, strong homes or, you know, financially strong homes. What about the kids? Will they lose the love for the game because of that? Yes, I think this gets lost along the way. Now it's all about money. A long time ago, you enjoyed playing soccer even if there was no money. But nowadays, it's not like that anymore. And the reason why, because the players, the new young players, see the European clubs as a way to escape. They do their research, they find out who buys them and who sells them. That is why any player, if asked about what his dream is, they will immediately give you the same answer. <laughs> the dream of making money in Europe and helping their entire family. The fun part of football is gone. And now everyone is about what can I gain from it? You know, so my years of playing, we had that thinking, okay, we're playing for the love of it. I remember when I used to play for the national team, I was with the national team for 11 years. And we were not looking at the money. We were looking at, okay, I'm wearing the national, my national jersey. So, and I can't remember, even when I was playing for Kotoko, I had a team in Italy and Torino. They came down, they wanted me to go. I said, no, 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 I'm happy I'm playing here. Why do you want me to travel out there? So time has changed and 
you know, we all need to move on and accept the fact. 400 players have a deal with Euro clubs. Many of them never left their homeland before. Some of them not even their home village. How do these players feel when they are suddenly so far from their home? This is Africa. In Africa, you do not, you do not get what you want. I want to play in Barcelona or, or Madrid. Because if I see Messi, if I see Ronaldo playing football and, and they're in front of me playing amazing football, it will be my destiny. And I will be just like them, you know? And, uh, and if you see me doing this, you know I like football. Yeah, and uh, I went with the national team to Russia. And from Russia, I did not come back to Ghana again. I decided to travel to Austria. My first day in Vienna, was not easy at all because I had been in Africa all my life, all my life really, you know, so traveling there was not easy at, at all for me. But on my first day, I met, um, I met my old friend who was here in Africa. He is a Nigerian player. His name is Lauren Kayole. If you've heard that name before, he's a very good player. So if I see him and say, oh, my African brother is here, so, where I was staying, he was also staying, you know. And we are like this, and we were always together. So he teaches me everything there was to know about Australia. But here's the funny thing. I was there, and I never seen so many white people. I was in Cologne Festival, the carnival. The carnival. I went from Frankfurt Airport directly to the carnival. <laughs> you can imagine that this was a lot of fun. Just lots of white people with fat stomachs. <laughs> lots of beer and so on. <laughs> What's going on here? It was really hilarious. All of a sudden, I was in another country. I knew it was another country, in Germany. But I've never seen so many white people in my life. You know... When I went there for one week, I found it was hard for me to eat because, you know, their food, maybe, maybe it's food that I haven't even ever eaten before, you know, so it was hard and their system is not easy. So the coach always told me, Mo, wait, wait and, uh, you know, you will adapt. So, yeah. Many African players also have to be prepared for other problems if they want to play in Europe. One of the most difficult is the accusation of lying on their age and thus gaining an unfair advantage in younger teams. Of course, we are still investigating this phenomenon. In the case of Yusofa Mukoko of Borussia Dortmund, it is claimed that he is 12 years old. Even experts have their doubts on this. The globe tested. This person here? Who is going to believe that? If I have to make an estimate, I would say he is 16 or older. Players lying about their age is very obvious. It's either to gain performance advantages against younger teams or to be transferred at a younger age legally. But many kids don't do this on purpose. In Africa, the birth of a child is treated differently as well as their birthday, which is not usual as how they do it in Germany. The lying about the age of players as a, a systematic setback. Most of the time, you have to pay for everything, even for a childbirth, and maybe they just don't have the money to do that. There are births at home as well. Therefore, you can't expect every childbirth to be reported, of course. It's not possible. The age of the African players whom I get to know there is rarely right. Um, the, the first thing that crosses your mind is that there's something wrong. Uh, the U-17 of Nigeria told the president that they just don't want to get stuck in the lies and they don't know what the birthday is and go for a 1st of January, which ends up being true. I also had played 2005. Um, the U-20 World Match, Nigeria got far ahead, reached the final, then against Argentina, against Messi and lost. Um, there were, I believe, nine from about 23 different places who were number one. It was crazy. Yep. <laughs> there were basically two cases, uh, either 
they decide to have a set age and keep that decision and the players themselves don't care about that. People don't argue or say much about it because everything is about the club, the president, the trainers, or there are a few that just say maybe the player is as old as you want and go with it. I have seen this as well, arguing if the player should be uh, 16 or 18 years old. I don't know. For FIFA, passport control is no longer enough. The age of the players is checked with a carpal test before the U-17 World Championship. Since then, countless players have been suspended because this test determines age with a relatively high accuracy. And even then, Anthony Yaboa, who admitted in 2010 at our visit that he made himself two years older back then, is questioning the decision. What may not be a problem for a non-professional soccer player in Africa could definitely mean the end of a soccer career for someone else. Mukoko is having a hard time from it. That's not his fault, you know, even if his age is not right. Our little Gigi's passport states he was born on January 1st. Some skeptics could find this date of birth very suspicious and often questionable. On another subject, where the young players don't even think about when they are in their training camps, is another point of view. What do the people from the guest countries think about the kids being transferred? What do German players and their fans of the local clubs say about new up-and-coming African players? In fact, if you take a good look down the German leagues, oof. A good thing that you will see is that in the first and second division there are people who oversee this and from time to time they question what are you doing there and then suddenly you become irrelevant. It is a very difficult path because so many people play soccer and only a certain small percentage get to play in the second and third division league. And. Um, it was hard for me, of course, because, sadly, I grew up with racism, um, which was much worse back then than it is now. And uh, people threw bananas at me on the field and yelled horrible things. It was very bad. Yeah, it hurt me, but in a way it made me much stronger. I prepared my mind that if I was to be in another country, whatever happens, I don't care. Sometimes you go to a place that has um, very different people. Um, and they're like comparing apples to bananas. You know? I mean, it's just like that sometimes. Well, I sure think that it has its source in the fan culture because actually inside the clubs, it is not an issue, you know? Wait a second. We need to change the word slave. I don't use that word, slave. Slave or slave trade, it means the same. Um, I honestly had to say that I was very lucky, though I had to listen to a lot of comments, but I also think in the last two years racism has come back again and is stronger than ever. And um, I think it's the worst thing of all, you know? Um, you know, in Europe, um, racism is there, but not everybody is a racist, you know? Sometimes you are with somebody and the way they talk to you, the way they laugh with you, you know. Because before, people were not used to having black Africans coming to Europe. We were very few, and now, well, you can see how it is. There has always been racism, even on the soccer field. That is why FIFA, the Bundesliga, and the media in Germany are adapting a zero-tolerance policy. We have heard these accusations from many players from Africa and have classified these accusations from vulgar to distorting and simply disgraceful. Just like what Prince Apoku had to experience in a UEFA Cup match. And that is why he started a marketing media campaign for all cultures named Together Against Unsportsmanlike Conduct. That was, a UEFA that Cup. was in the UEFA Cup. So, uh, that was the first day I met Lothar. He was moving around, and I was chasing him. So I just wanted to frustrate him. So I decided to step on, on his toes. So he was feeling the pain, and he looked at me. And the first time he said, be careful, my friend. And I said, sorry. And later on, I came again, stepped on him again, and he said, you black monkey. And, I, and 
I said, I'm going to show you what a black monkey can do. So I started, I started kicking him, and then the referee came and gave me a yellow card. Official parties spend a lot of money and resources to combat racism on the field, but especially among fans. Banner advertising, advertising trailers, and fan campaigns fight racism and prejudice. But, as with many things in society, we are still far from reaching our goal. Susanna, yes, that's exactly what it sounds like. You don't use that word anymore. Uh, that was a long time ago. Now, how do you say another word for slave? African trade? Yes, yes. So you're using different words, meansing words, playing with them, but at the end is the same. Different words, uh, uh, the same meaning. How can this be? It's uh, unacceptable. The country has made some progress, good progress, I believe, compared to how it was 20 or 30 years ago. I also think it's great when young Germans with a migration background uh, choose Germany and stay there. It would be a very good decision because it helps, it just helps. Um, I don't believe that players that are coming up now are scared of racism. It's going to disappear slowly. In a hundred years, it's going to be difficult to tell who is Ghanaian or pure German. This question about who is black and who is white will not be relevant anymore. It won't matter anymore. But what weighs as much as racism in the world of professional soccer is corruption. Especially in African countries, it is particularly strong. Of course, not only within soccer, but here it is most evident. Players on strike, bribes from FIFA, stadiums subsidized with millions but never built, we have asked people from all over the world to give us interviews, but we have almost always received refusals or statements like such. Corruption doesn't just wipe out FIFA-approved finances, sponsors, or the country itself. African club soccer has a general financial problem. We have seen it on the pitches and in the training teams, but also in the salaries of the players. Here in Europe, we have weekly salaries of up to 250,000 euros. In Ghana, we see a different picture. You can see that, you can uh, see that uh, uh, how uh, the clubs are suffering. They've been paying uh, a player, let's say for instance, uh, 100 euros, a month. Can you imagine a top player in Ghana making 100 euros? This can seem unbelievable for us, but how can this problem be dealt with? Well, the world is not fair, is it? But what can we do in our little way is to make sure that there are rules. Since we're talking football, government should do their part because um, the countries also fall under the, the countries that have decided to join FIFA. I think FIFA being the, the, the world controlling body for football um, know what is better as compared to that of um, the government aspect in terms of football. Yeah, FIFA should come out with some laws so that if they get you, if you, if you, if you are not, if you are like they did to Barcelona some years ago, they, you cannot sign a player for two years. I, I, now I think Atletico Madrid, they can't sign a player for two years or one year, that kind of thing, so that it will curtail some of these things for us. As we can see, not even the people who suffer from corruption agree on how to handle it. Whether it is the state or FIFA, someone should determine the rules and enforce them. But one thing is clear, this is something the world can no longer tolerate. The players were on strike. We had to return a day later to Brazil because there was no money. The strikes, for example, of the 2014 Ghana national team show that problems have become very predominant, so much that they have reached even the national teams. This case has already been discussed in the media and looks like a last call for help even when the officially approved finances are not reaching the national team players we want to know what happens to the money and where it ends up corruption is high and this is one of the main reasons why the players end up without any of their rightfully earned money yeah i think it's going to other individuals pockets 
And that is very, very sad. And that, that is the sad and bitter truth. The players know if we don't fight and take our money, it's over. Yes, the money is flowing in the wrong direction. And we need to do something about it. Like I said, money is flowing in the wrong way. It's not where it's needed. That's our problem as well, not only in Ghana, but in Africa in general. Uh, the leaders on, at the top know why this is not flowing down to the grassroots to actually help develop um, the game. The players know that if they don't take the money when given, the officials are going to end up with it. So yes, the money is available. The players need to take their share. If I have the opportunity to serve on FIFA, probably what, what, what I would like to introduce is let the clubs deal with the clubs directly or let the parent represent um, their children when it comes to deals. So it means that there is no middleman like an agent who will come and enslave players and then just put players there and make money for himself. These unfortunate circumstances can't be resolved by the soccer clubs or the FIFA alone. But there are a few projects in Europe that link together soccer with charity. Education, Education is very important. If you can't speak or read German, then the contract should be made in English. So here's the first lesson. If you don't go to school, you won't learn how to read. So the first step is education. The problem is not about soccer. The problem lies in society. The problem is that we are wealthy in Europe and not in other countries. And they will not come here to Ghana. Everyone wants to get a slice of the pie. And within soccer, it is exactly the same way. I believe is very true uh, what the trainer said to fight the cause and to achieve equality in other countries. It is important for people to understand that it's a slow process and we are taking small steps towards equality, especially here in Africa. There should be more done for uh, the youth from 10, 12, 13 years. There are, there are no leaks. There is no really development because no, there is no money to develop. If you see every team in, uh, in Ghana, in general in Africa, they cannot even uh, feed, feed uh, young teams. There is no, and young boys who have no competition, they, they, they they, they cannot develop uh, like, like they do it in Europe. Does, um, yes, the program, the Right Dream Give Back, um, is a program where students as well as the former students invest in their home villages. They build wells and invest in infrastructure and give back to the community. Of course, there are a lot of solutions out of the soccer sport and its environment that are supposed to help Africa. Does Africa really need our help? Yes, but not only to promote soccer players, but especially dealing with equality and human rights. There is a lot of good things we could do, especially with the FIFA. It has certain responsibilities and has to uphold them. And well, I think that there are projects that can help create self-sustainment. And that way, soccer can really develop the career for a lot of players that maybe need that kind of support and opportunities that they wouldn't get elsewhere. Innovative ideas and great support from the rest of the world reach Africa in their thousands. There are already billions of euros that are being invested into the black continent to fight the well-known local problems. But our little Gigi does not pay any mind to it. He has nothing, nothing but a dream. The dream to free his mother, his sisters, and himself from the extreme poverty he's surrounded by. In a country where possibilities are scarce, he has to protect himself against corruption, human trafficking, and thousands of other talented young boys 
that also have nothing thing but soccer. On our journey, we were lucky to meet him, and we hope that he and his country get a better future. This trip to a foreign continent has given us a deeper insight into a foreign culture, in their way of life and their customs. Soccer bounds people, but it should not only be seen as a means to make money, but first and foremost as a way that, without words, this trip to a foreign continent has given us a deeper insight into a foreign culture, in their way of life and their customs. Soccer bounds people, but it should not only be seen as a means to make money, but first and foremost as a way that, without words, without anything other than actions, can connect the whole entire world. Sometimes a ball and a smile is the only thing you need to make new friends. A world together is our big dream. Never had much, only big dreams and fire. In the struggle when the times been rough, passion leading the way like a lighter. Blessed with the heart of a liar, no question we feel but we try on. We believe no illusion, push it through with the love and emotion. Yeah. In the street we've been playing with the tin can, satisfied with some rice and chicken. Now we're running big things anyway, going to a brighter day. Yeah. I believe one life, one dream. No matter what, keep it up for the team. No doubt in my mind. When I fall, I get up yeah. every time. Let dein Traum. Deine Zeit, dein Moment ist genau so. Let dein Traum. Vertrau auf dein Herz und dann nicht auf die anderen. No. Let dein Traum. Oh, just believe in yourself right now. Let dein Traum. Oh, I'm 